This is an extremely good bitter brush side. Bitter brush is our winter forage for our deer and our elk herds, as well as uh, numerous smaller animals, a really high protein feed. But what we have here is, is an 80 year old tree, a uh, juniper tree that's taking over. We have a 10 year old juniper tree underneath here. And right off here, we have a 25 year old, four or five 25 year old juniper trees. So we have an 80 year old juniper tree growing up to the skeleton of a bitter brush. Now on south faces, uh, almost all our bitter brush has been lost because of the winter usage and the juniper trees. If something is not done with these juniper trees very, very soon, um, this will no longer be a forage site for our game in the wintertime. It will be just a stand of juniper. A lot of people were, you know, private landowners, grazing permittees, uh, even even uh, groups, wildlife interest, uh, and, and agencies like Bureau of Land Management were trying to address juniper uh, problems, and they were doing a small project here and a small project there to restore an quake and aspen stand or or other preferred or, or important plant community like a ripe riparian area or a spring and uh, and these are very important but in some cases it caused the congregation of wildlife in those areas and they weren't as effective as they could have been in addition it never in many cases uh, these juniper thinning or management programs were not tied in with the overall ecological need which was to reintroduce fire into the system uh, like it was historically so Due to the ongoing science uh, by the Agriculture Research Service and Oregon State University and the BLM's professional knowledge and, and others, then uh, we started address, looking to address the issue on a broader scale where we uh, involve all the landowners or, or parties in, in a certain area of drainage or watershed and, they were, and, and to address the quake and aspen problem or you know, the decline in quake and aspen or riparian areas in a broader scale. And that, that did away with the Congregation of Wildlife issue. It also uh, allowed us to get rid of some of the liability issues for, for private landowners and for the BLM of somebody's project, like a fire, crossing on, onto somebody else's property, which, which causes liability problems. In addition, you could get technical assistance, like from the BLM, to address the public safety issues when you, when you burn. So all these things, uh, pooled, basically, cooperatively, uh, pooled resources so that we could uh, get these projects done more efficiently on a larger scale. They were more efficient economically, ecologically, and from a watershed standpoint, did a much better job and, um, and solved problems of small projects and, and uh, increased the efficiency of getting them done. Early on, um, on our on our private burns, which we never had, uh, you know, any anybody helping us on, we were out there lighting the fires by hand, and and there was an extreme risk and liability from those fires getting away from us. In addition, as you move into the juniper plant communities, plant communities that had moved from grass sagebrush to being dominated by juniper, where the grass and the brush had declined, the problems with burning those became become larger because you don't have the ladder fields, the fine fields, they're harder to burn. You need more heat to get them started. Once you get them started sometimes, then you can burn. From our standpoint, we never had the technology as a private landowner to do that. When uh, BLM cooperated with us, and they bring in the technology or, or, or help bring in the technology in many cases through a private contractor where we could bring in a hill of torch to lay down fire in a more efficient, effective manner to generate the heat necessary to start the fire and get fires to carry through plant communities that we couldn't burn before. And this saves on uh, the amount of cutting and pre-treatments necessary to get fire introduced back in the system. So the number of junipers to cut to re-establish fire into the system was much less. And we couldn't do that on our own. We need 
uh, the assistance both from technology and in some cases resources to get the job done. Some of the consequences of not doing anything are uh, are really really dramatic because there's areas that haven't been treated that have been moving to juniper for you know dominated by juniper for a hundred years and there's just lots of bare ground and soil movement from these areas and there's really no habitat there at the ground level for for all the critters that live there so. You have, you have uh, a loss in terms of thick juniper collecting snowfall, and in many cases there's a, a measured loss of 25% or more just from the interception and evaporation after a snowfall during the winter to less moisture getting to the ground, less infiltration of moisture in the ground. So you kind of have a double loss from, from the system. You have uh, interception, you have competition, you have increased bare ground, and so pretty soon the things that we need to run our business are gone too because that water runs the system. It runs the system from a plant community, wildlife habitat, but our forage base also. So um, we not only lose forage quantity when resource conditions or watershed declines occur, we lose the timing of, uh, of our use. In other words, forage availability uh, is shortened uh, during when we can use it because the system dries out. So you have springs that aren't there to water our cattle. Uh, you have forage conditions that dry up a month and a half earlier than they do when you have a more open, diverse plant community. And all these things combine to hurt our, our cattle business as much as it, it hurts wildlife habitat and the watershed. You know, some people have miscommunicated that it's a weed. It, it's not, but it is. It's like anything. Too much of anything can be bad or can be negative towards other things that are important. And those choices uh, are what land manners, managers have to do. And there, there's a point there when you get watershed declines or wildlife habitat declines that are basically permanent. Uh, or approach that type of level, then you need to deal with them. And once people understand that, that the juniper management is not about eradication, but it's about, about a balance out on the landscape, and that it benefits a whole bunch of th different things, uh, wildlife species of many different kinds, then that's very, that, that helps solve those problems. And having the science now evolving at the local level has been a big help in getting rid of some misconceptions that people have about juniper management. I'm Tony Urizer. Uh, this project I believe was in 98-99. Uh, I'm a local rancher here in the Burns area. We have about 6,000 acres of this type of country that you're looking at right here now. Uh, this has all been fallen. There's been, uh, you'll see here, a select site of it that's been burnt, and then we did a minimal amount of broadcast seeding on it. And so I'll just kind of walk around here and show you what's going on. Okay, on this site across this little draw right here, uh, you can see small junipers and, and where we've fallen trees. Now this hasn't been treated with fire. It was just, this was uh, what the project was originally set up to do, was to just fall trees. Now we've gone in on this other side, we've done some uh, a burning, and uh, on this ridge top up here, uh, the canopy was so thick with junipers that there was absolutely nothing growing. So we went up there, burnt up the junipers, and planted it to uh, crested wheat and some forage kochia. Now there's not a lot of the forage kochia and crested wheat but where there was absolutely no plants there's a lot of native plants coming back in. The burning is, seems to have taken out a good part of the the rabbit brush and sagebrush at this point. Here is, uh, is some of the forage kochia that's been planted. 
Uh, it seems to be very palatable to the deer. Uh, it's kind of a year-round plant. They, uh, they prefer it more in the fall. Uh, you can see quite a bit of it coming in here in spots. Right next to it right here, there's some crested wheat we planted. Here's some that's, uh, as every most people know, is non-native, but it, we, uh, when we did our broadcasting of the kosher, we also broadcasted some crested wheat. And I see that there's a few plants coming, and, and uh, some of them are even coming in the, probably the non-burned areas. We've got some buckbrush coming in. And it wasn't here prior, but the fire disturbance evidently brought it, because there's quite a bit of it coming in, too. When we did the burn up here, I, my hired man and I, and then my nephew or niece or whoever had a pulse that was around it, to help us to run a torch, and we just started at the bottom of the canyon down here. And uh, we did it late in the year, in like uh, late October, early November. I found out since then it's be better to start in late September, early October, uh, just because it burns much cleaner and you get uh, a lot better carriage of the fire. We left them out in mahogany. We tried to keep them out of the fire as much as possible. They were part of the grant to leave them out in mahogany as is in other areas where there's aspen to, to leave the aspen. Some of it did get caught on the fringes, but for the most part we tried to save it. So. Uh, uh, there again, it's a wildlife uh, plant, and uh, it's not near as, a, as invasive as a species as a juniper tree. Now, also with the fire, we tried to kill all the young small trees coming. Uh, we didn't get it done, but we did get part of them. If you look across the draw over here, you can see all kinds of little trees coming, and as we burn that, hopefully we can get some of them. So. Uh, but it's all, it's kind of coming together pretty nice what we've done. It's just, it's a long process and, and uh, like I say, that wasn't part of our grant. The burning and the seeding wasn't part of the grant, so we're just doing that on our own. And, and uh, it gets so expensive to, to hire a pile of brush and, and we're fortunate in the, we're close to town. People have come up and cut firewood out of a, a good share of this. And so then it's basically the limbs are left, and then we just go in and burn behind the, the uh, woodcutters. Uh, I was asked uh, on a treatment of this how often we need to go through or, or have I thought about it. And in my opinion, in uh, 10 to 15 years would be probably a good uh, time frame. Uh, kind of if we, it could be done every 10 to 15 years. The, the idea is these trees get to be about 10 foot tall, then they start shading out the area and you don't get the uh, fire to pull through them quite like you would like to. So if you can keep the trees under say 10, 10 to 15 foot tall, then you've got some under storage to pull the fire through. So uh, I hope the next generation gets to do this. I'm hoping I can get this cleaned up for this generation because we've got uh, probably 1,200 acres down right now that's not treated. So we're just slowly working at it and, and uh, keep hammering on it until we get it cleaned up.